All right, so tonight we have a, a kind of a, a range of different topics. Um, we're gonna talk uh, brook trout, whitefish, uh, the sort of current situation of uh, management in the COVID-19 world, uh, angler survey, and then uh, we've got some uh, guests from uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, who will talk about invasive species as well as lake trout. Um, and so I think it'll be a, an interesting program covering a lot of different topics. Uh, just our, our Zoom intro to, to folks who might be new to Zoom, uh, there is the mute button in the lower left. Um, I do have everybody muted as they come in, um, but when we do get to the uh, question and answer period, uh, there will be opportunities to raise your hand. So over to the, if you click the participants uh, button along the bottom of the screen, uh, that will pop up a participants list. You can actually see who else is here. It's always nice to kind of know who we're talking to. Um, and uh, the raise the hand button is also at the bottom of that participants list, important. Uh, we will use that to kind of control things. Uh, other options, uh, if you'd rather type into a uh, question to the chat button, that's also an option. So we do have the chat uh, in the middle there on the bottom, and then that will pop out up a, a menu, uh, either off to the side or floating somewhere. And you can use that to enter a question and our uh, speakers can uh, address those as well. So again, that uh, that is where we, uh, that's our, our plan for tonight. And I think with that, we can, uh, start start working. So Brad, I'll let you kind of take things from here. Sure. Looks like I'll be pinch hitting for Titus. Hopefully I can at least slap a solid single center here as a late late pinch hitter for the meeting. First up we're gonna go over to Cheryl who's gonna be give us an update on our brook trout stocking and brook trout stocking plan. So Cheryl, if you're able to share your screen, we can get rolling. Okay, stand by for just one second. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you're good to go. All right. Thanks, Brad, and thanks, Titus. So before I dive into the details of our brook trail plan, I just want to acknowledge the folks who were on the team charged with developing it. The DNR task team is made up of Jeff Mosier and Neil Rosenberg from our fish culture section, Tammy Paoli, Aaron Schiller, and Laura Schmidt, who are fish biologists on Green Bay and Lake Michigan, Brad Eggold, who is the district, Great Lakes District Supervisor, and I'm the Southern Lake Michigan Fish Team Supervisor. Our stocking plan for the years 2020 to 2022 is shown on this table. It was developed throughout 2019 with much input from our stakeholders. In fact, I'm sure many of you participated in one or more of the meetings we held that year. One of the notable changes you can see from the 2019 stocking plan is that we are reintroducing brook trout into the Lake Michigan stocking program. We have not had routine brook trout stocking since 2003, but we are once again stocking brook trout with 50,000 stocked per year for the next several years. The goal of the brook trout stocking effort is to increase near shore fishing opportunities. Our task team researched previous brook trout stocking efforts by Michigan DNR, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Wisconsin DNR in Lakes Michigan and Superior. Tonight I'd like to highlight the past efforts in Wisconsin waters of Lake Michigan. The blue bars in this figure represent the numbers of brook trout stocked each year. As you can see, most brook trout stocking stopped after 2003 except for roughly 40,500 brook trout that were stocked in 2010. Over the years, we stocked a combination of St. Croix and Nipigon strains with about 6.6 .6 million total brook trout stocked since 1969. The black line that goes across the graph is the angler harvest from our creel surveys, charter reports, and moored boat surveys. During this time frame, over 253,000 brook trout were harvested. We saw a drastic drop in harvest starting in the late 1980s that we never really rebounded from, likely due to the change in productivity of the lake brought on by invasive mussels. 
This figure breaks down the harvest of those 253,000 brook trout by the type of fishery in which they were caught. Pier shore and stream anglers harvested the majority of brook trout from 1969 to 2019, and boat anglers harvested only about 11% of the brook trout. In the past, brook trout certainly provided nearshore fishing opportunities, and as I previously mentioned, that's the goal in stocking them now. In determining where to stock brook trout moving forward, the task team decided that in order to optimize our returns, we should stock 25,000 brook trout in each of two locations, rather than stocking fewer fish in more locations. One stocking location would be in the northern half of the lake and the other in the south. We analyzed the harvest by county in the years 1986 to 2003, as this time frame had the most consistent harvest. The percentage shown on the y-axis of the graph was calculated based on fishing effort for brook trout and the brook trout harvest and harvest rate per total number of brook trout stocked in that area. Based on this data, we recommended Milwaukee and Manitowoc for brook trout stocking. Even though Green Bay has a higher harvest rate than Manitowoc, the bay isn't targeted for this stocking effort because it already provides anglers with more near shore fishing opportunities than the lake does. The table shown here shows you our plan is to stock 50,000 brook trout each year from now through 2024. We are stocking St. Croix strain this year and next year. In fact, the Milwaukee fish were stocked last week and the Manitowoc fish are getting stocked this week. The brook trout were raised at our hatchery in St. Croix Falls and they are approximately six inches long at the time of stocking. The picture on the right is one of the newly stocked fish in Milwaukee. We'll use fin clips so that when we encounter fish in the future, the clip will help us to identify which year class of fish is from. Starting as early as 2022, we could potentially switch to Tobin Harbor strain, which is a Lake Superior strain of brook trout or a coaster brook trout. We would transfer those eggs from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Iron River Hatchery to our St. Croix Falls Hatchery to raise. There is a logistical hurdle to clear with stocking Tobin Harbor strain, which has to do with the bacterial pathogen that was found at the Iron River Hatchery. The hatchery was disinfected in 2019, and they now need to test negative for that bacterial pathogen for three consecutive years before we would consider accepting their eggs at St. Croix Falls. There are some unknowns with this bacteria, so it's not 100% clear at this point if we'll be able to stock the Tobin Harbor fish in 2022. However, we do have the ability to continue stocking the St. Croix strain if needed. Evaluating the brook trout stocking program will be done using our existing sport fishing data, which is made up of our Lake Michigan Creel Survey Program, mandatory monthly charter boat reports, and moored boat surveys. We created benchmarks for this study based on the data we collected when we were stocking brook trout in the past. The benchmarks we will use to define the success of the program include an annual harvest of 500 to 1,000 brook trout, the annual catch should be one to 2,000 brook trout, which would account for catch and release angling that isn't factored into the expected harvest. Because the intent of the brook trout program is to increase the nearshore fishery, we expect the harvest from the pier, shore, and stream fisheries to be more than half of the total brook trout harvest. Directed fishing effort, meaning the fishing effort by anglers specifically targeting brook trout, should be more than 15,000 angler hours per year. We expect to see an increase in directed effort from year to year as anglers become more aware of the brook trout stocking program and gain enthusiasm for it. In addition, 75% or more of the directed effort should be in the pier, shore, and stream fisheries. The current fishing regulations are a daily bag limit of five for all salmonids in total, including brook, rainbow, and brown trout, as well as Chinook and coho salmon. There's a 10 inch minimum size limit and the season is open year round. We are not pursuing any changes to these regulations currently, but that is something that could be looked at in the future if needed. The current state record brook trout for outlying waters is 10 pounds, one ounce and 24 and a half inches long. It was caught back in 1999. Will the record stand or will it be broken? Only time will tell. With that, um, Brad, I believe I have time for some questions. Yeah, people about, about five minutes or so for questions. If you want to raise your hand, we'll call on you. If, you, if there's any questions on 
Cheryl's presentation. All right, not seeing any. And then I will, uh, I'll get Kevin Nazi. Let's see here. I think I can unmute you. Go ahead, Kevin. Hi, um, I just um, listened in and I caught the tail end. Um, did she say that 25,000 were only going in two harbors? Yeah, yeah that's correct. Oh, go ahead. Oh, gotcha. 25,000 to Manitowoc and 25,000 to Milwaukee. Okay, I, you know, who decided on those two? And also, I, I believe the Creel misses the majority of brook trout caught in the past. Spring and fall are the prime times. And back in the day, I mean, I'm, I've lived here my whole life. I never was creeled in spring or fall when we caught brook trout in the Algoma Harbor. I just feel it's a disservice after all this effort to get brook trout stocked again, and they don't move a lot, to not stock them, uh, at least a token stocking in all the harbors. Our, so our creel survey starts March 15th and it runs through the end of October on, at all of our, our lakefront areas. Of course, it is hit or miss if you're going to encounter a creel clerk when you're out because they're on the move. They don't spend all day in, in one area. Um, so, so I understand that you may have not encountered creel clerks in the past, but we did analyze the, the past harvest um, and, and looked at fishing effort and all of those things for brook trout, and that's how we settled on Manitowoc and Milwaukee. And um, maybe you missed it. I heard you said you, you came in a little late, but we, we, as a task team, the DNR task team, who was looking at our options and, and how we were going to handle this, we decided it was important to stock one harbor in the northern half of the lake and one harbor in the southern half of the lake. And Manitowoc in the past had performed better than the other um, counties to the north. Okay, I still think that in order to keep people excited outside of those two communities, if you're going to stock brook trout again, it really only matters to people in those communities. And I, I really believe that you could have put 5,000 in each or whatever that number might be and had at least that opportunity to, um, 5,000 fish near shore is a lot of fish, even if only 100 of them are caught. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a lot. And I just hope that can be reconsidered again in the in the future uh, so this doesn't become a permanent thing. Yeah, Kevin, one of the things we looked at and we, we took a lot of information from our mass marketing program and, and Chuck Bronte, Matt Cornus, and much of their work looked at analyzing what batch or what size batch sizes should we stock so that we can detect, you know, how well they're performing out in the lake. Granted, it's, a, it's not quite apples to apples comparison, but they, they did a lot of work on this, came back with about a 25,000 fish lot, give or take, to, to whether we're doing steelhead or Chinook so that we can actually determine the, how well a certain stocking is doing by location, et cetera. So we, we use some of that knowledge in setting up this particular protocol. But obviously with that said, you know, there's more discussion. And I, I think if we would stock fewer fish, we're gonna see, it's gonna be harder and harder to analyze how well the stocking actually is working. I, I honestly believe in the power of social media nowadays and, and people are posting pictures and information all the time from all the ports all year long that really doesn't always match the creel. And I, I really believe that, that the creel misses honestly a vast majority of fish that are caught from shore and pier because it's so random and it's a half an hour, hour here and there on a whole day. So I, you know, that's just my feeling. I'm going to, I'm going to leave it at that, but I, I, I really hope that you would consider uh, farming these fish out uh, all over the place, no matter what the, the data says. Okay. Go ahead, Jerry. You might have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to agree with Kevin on this as well. I guess I'm not picking a man to walk, but I believe that the fishing effort is not there. Um, there's plenty of other ports that have a lot more fishing effort and would be well suited for these fish as well. I think, I think Kevin hit it square in the head is, is that it's kind of a disservice to everybody in the, in, on the Wisconsin side that there's only two ports being stocked with these. Um, I think it should be all over. I think each port should get a percentage 
of, of these fish. I don't know that I necessarily the 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 uh, know that these should just go to two ports. So I I I don't even know when this discussion had come up as far as where these were going to be stacked. I, I never heard anything or seen any notice about that. All right. Go ahead, Bob. To a couple more, and then we'll, we'll yeah. move on. Cheryl, just a quick question. The picture you showed of the uh, uh, brook trout going into uh, it looked like the Milwaukee River over by Lakefront Brewing. Is that Lakefront Brewing? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. The, the only question I have is, I was not there because we did not know the date. How was the predation? How was the aerial predation? It's underneath an overpass, so I wouldn't think there were a lot of cormorants and seagulls. I am just looking for maximizing survival. Yeah, and that's fair. Um, I was not there when they were stocked either, but I did not hear of any issues from the two truck drivers who were on site that day. Very good, thank you. And we'll finish up with Keith and then we'll move on. And we can, uh, there might be some time at the end here for other additional questions or, or per uh, what, what Titus has to say. Go ahead, Keith. You might have to unmute yourself. Keith, it looks like you're talking, but you're still muted. If I can unmute mute him. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? There we go. There we go. Okay. A little something came up and said unmute, so I hit it. So uh, uh, just as an observation, as an um, avid birch trout fisherman, any consideration taken to the upstream movement of these fish, you know, where anglers could get, uh, say, Algoma River or whatever, um, that's better than other ports, you know, where, uh, you know, we used to get them in Green Bay and Little River about 200 yards from where I'm sitting right now. It was a great fishery, um, whether it was in the lake or, or in the streams in the fall. So any consideration on that or just consideration of out in the lake fishing? And that's all I had. That is something we've talked about for sure. Um, it's unknown at this point, really, how these fish are going to behave. And that's something we'll be watching over the next several years. Um, it's been so long since we've stocked brook trout in Lake Michigan. And as you know, it's a vastly different ecosystem now. So it remains to be seen. Will they fall in love with eating gobies and hang out in the harbors more? Or will they run the rivers? I, I don't know. We'll, we'll find out together. All right, thanks, Cheryl. And uh, let's move on to my presentation about our Lake Michigan Lake Whitefish process. Let's see if we can fire it up here. All right, so we have been working on a Lake Whitefish information comment gathering process for many months now. And we've been working with a variety of stakeholders, commercial fishermen, interested stakeholders, anglers, et cetera, to quite simply discuss information, listen to comments, suggestions. And basically the main objective as you can see there is to learn and have ideas on how to properly manage this important sport fishery and commercial fishery of Lake Michigan. It's a fairly lengthy process right now. We have created a scope statement that was approved by the Natural Resources Board several months ago. It's a long process to go from a scope statement approval to actually final rules and regulations. We're right now in this box here 14, which, which can be quite a few months in length. Total time to potentially work on this uh, idea put forth regulations that finally get put into rule and law can be up to a 30 month process. We put out a draft timeline and we're essentially right here in November where we've developed some really overarching draft management options which I'll get into a little bit later. Obtaining comments and then working through May and June of next year where we're gonna have to start drafting rule language if we wanna hit the end of this 30 month process. Then it goes into internal and legislative review, which can be long and laborious. 
and hopefully in the back end at the latest we would have these rules in effect in 2022 but obviously depending on how this last row of uh review goes it could be a lot shorter if we have fairly internal and legislative review in a more timely fashion we've had a lot of meetings to date we've had public meetings you can see three and then a fourth one is highlighted coming up november 17th we've also attended and, and members have attended the lake michigan commercial fishing board meetings there's been two and there's one slated for november 12th coming up here in a couple of weeks so we've had a lot of meetings talked a lot of, about a lot of information and we present a lot of information so this is everything that we've done to date at these meetings you can see the wide variety of topics and information that we've provided ranging from our movement patterns to what we're doing with our whitefish comprehensive study out in the bay and lastly what we did last meeting was look at management options moving forward and i'm going to touch on some of those right now we broke it down and there, there obviously could be a few more here but i broke it down into three main components one is our electronic fish harvest reporting system and then are we going to look at any regulations related to season zones gears and then obviously the biggest one and that is regulations related to the quotas and, and current quotas in the system for our electronic fish harvest reporting system we have an online system through a web-based system that allows the commercials to report their catch through that system it's fairly simple it has a home screen that you're seeing here you can look at recent entries as well as add new entries each day. These cards that we have here can be pressed and they flip around showing you the crew and the boats and any contract permitted fish. Probably the, the one hallmark of the system is that on this front page, it will show the commercial fishermen by lake, zone and species, what their current quota is, as well as how many fish they have yet to catch or how many, how many fish they've caught year to date. And we hope to, at the end of this process, make this mandatory for all commercial fishers of the Great Lakes. In addition, if we have something that's going uh, quicker than the 30 month process, some kind of special initiative season, et cetera, we would have the electronic fish harvest reporting system be enacted at that time. We also talked a little bit about uh, allocation, particularly in the Bay. Uh, between the, the sport and commercials for any whitefish quota that's gets established in Green Bay. And we looked at past history and essentially we've done it 50-50 split by weight. And we've also done it 50-50 split by numbers and based on the size of the fish that get caught, that translates as you can see into about a 40-60 split by weight. So we had a good discussion on that and, and two possible ways to move forward uh, during this process. And then lastly, we talked or talked a little, uh, little bit about quotas in the Green Bay and Lake Michigan. And here is a figure showing the colors in yellow, green, and blue are the current commercial fishing zones one, two, and three. And on top of that are overlaid Wisconsin management units uh, one, two before this red line, and then three through six going down the coast. As if you've been in attendance, Scott Hansen has been working on a catch at age model for waters of Green Bay, which is west of this red line, and then Lake Michigan, which is east of this red line. So moving forward, a framework for looking at quotas will be presented, as I'll say in a little bit, November 12th commercial fishing board meeting uh, in Green Bay's management units one and two, what is our harvestable surplus? How many fish are we going to hold back for assessment and then determining what the commercial quota and recreational quota would be for Green Bay and the same thing for Lake Michigan and management units three through six do the same thing with that. We're still working on this. Uh, we will be presenting it at the commercial fishing board meeting on November 12th at 530. I encourage anybody that wants to sit in and listen on that can certainly do so. We'll be sending out information and meeting links for that probably in the next week or so. If you're interested and you'd like to be part of the group and you want to see what's going on, I recommend that you uh, copy down this link. It takes you to our commercial uh, or Lake Whitefish commercial page. 
you can see all the past notes, all the past presentations that have occurred for that process. You can also go to dnrw.gov, search for Lake Michigan commercial fishing, click on the first link, it'll get you to the same page. Probably the best way though, is to go to dnrwi.gov, search for Lake Michigan fisheries, click on that homepage, and then scroll down to the bottom and subscribe to that page. That will then get uh, notices like these meetings directly to your inbox so that when they come out, you won't have any chance of missing it. And with that, my, my brief uh, review of our Lake Whitefish public meetings is over. Looks like we probably have some time for some questions if there are any out there. Uh, go ahead, Charlie. Okay, there you go. You can hear me now? Yep. Okay. Uh, just a couple comments uh, on this process. Uh, we've actually uh, didn't start this uh, three months ago. We've been working on this for over seven years. Uh, when we first went to the governor's office about uh, an emergency rule to move some whitefish from zone two to zone one. Uh, at that meeting, we were told uh, that we, if we didn't ask for the emergency rule through the governor's office, that uh, the DNR would deal with it through the rulemaking process that year. Well, we went through meetings and the meetings raised some questions. So now we've uh, tagged the fist for the DNR. We've done extra fishing. Uh, we bought the tags ourselves. Uh, we work very closely with Titus uh, at Sea Grant to develop a catch composition study uh, to show that uh, our bycatch in the bay was very minimal and that our interaction with the sport fishery was almost non-existent. Uh, and so far that's went well. Uh, we've now brought UWGB into the study and we're sponsoring a graduate student who is uh, uh, going to write a thesis on it. So we just finished uh, the third year of that two-year study, and there's been some issues with getting monitors and stuff, so that's why it's ongoing. Uh, we're, we've been asked to uh, uh, hire uh, through the UWGB LTE to, uh, to work with the grad student for next year. So in, in this process of filling in this 20 year gap in data that, you know, because the commercial fishery has not been monitored in the Bay at all. Uh, we, we've put quite a bit of effort into it. Uh, we had passed a motion uh, at our meeting a couple months ago that uh, we believe that uh, for next year uh, with this huge harvestable surplus in there in the lower Bay that, uh, we should raise that bay quota probably through an emergency rule and uh, uh, make uh, add, add 200,000 pounds to the bay quota. So not only would that uh, help the commercial fishery as we're coming out of this COVID year, which has been uh, difficult for business, but it also would greatly enhance this study. Uh, one of the things we're trying to predict with the study is what's going to happen if we fish more fish. So according to uh, the 50-50 split that's being talked about, which is really not really germane right now, it may be down the road when the fish uh, diminish, but uh, if the harvestable surplus is 2.25 million as uh, Eob and Scott's uh, uh, stock analysis shows, uh, if we fished another 200,000, we still, between the sport and the commercial fishery, would only be fishing a third of that harvestable surplus. So uh, we're, we're looking to get that on the table here. And uh, we've had some very productive informational meetings with this task force that's, uh, uh, we're informing about how the study goes, but uh, uh, we're, we're we're ready to move forward. We, we need to do something. 
the uh, stuff in a lake uh, is concerning. Uh, one of the one of the problems with the lake is that Zone Two has bay fish and lake fish, and it has a lot of fishers uh, in it who are not doing much fishing right now. So uh, the uh, the the quota system, you know, with our permanent transfer system, uh, people have spent a lot of money uh, acquiring quota in different areas. So how we make that work uh, now that we're running a model for the bay and the lake, when it used to just be one model for the whole state, uh, is going to take a little time to sort out. But the uh, the the five year average harvest in Lake Michigan is around 646,000 pounds. That's for zone two and zone three in the lake. And uh, the suggested uh, uh, model number is 600,000. So, so we're not endangering anything in the lake as we work our way through this process. So that's uh, kind of where we're at on the fishing board and as fishermen right now. I just want to add that in there to Brad's comments. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, I'll just give you a, a super brief update um, wh what we've been doing during this uh, pandemic in general. I think many of you have seen uh, some press releases, etc. cetera. Uh, we've primarily been doing all of our fish culture things that we've been doing as far as getting eggs, getting them in the hatchery, and stocking fish. Uh, we just uh, sent out, uh, as Cheryl mentioned, a press release that said we, we finished up our stocking on Lake Michigan with these brook trout. We had previously stocked out the fish as of June 1st as well, putting the, the fish as Cheryl outlined in the stocking table, our commitments for the, the, the new quotas that were established starting here in 2020. So they've been up and running this entire time. They've had some procedural things that they've worked out in the hatchery system to try and keep uh, different crews on at different times. Um, in addition, we have been able to collect uh, steelhead eggs in the spring, as well as Chinook salmon in the fall. We're currently collecting co salmon eggs. And we went out today to look for sea frail and brown trout brood stock so that we can ensure that we get enough eggs for our sea frail and program. So uh, our, our fish culture system is, is coming along uh, per normal. Uh, as far as what we've been doing as far as surveys, pretty much the surveys that we can do with uh, limited staff, two to three people following all the protocols we're all familiar with in terms of uh, safe distances, et cetera, we've been able to do. This started out in maybe uh, late, late May or so where we were able to start doing some of our regular type surveys and we've continued to do those throughout the year. So we've been, we've been lucky, we've developed a lot of protocols uh, for operating the RV Corgonis as well as some other surveys that we're, we've been able to do, maybe a slightly altered plans where we'd normally go out with three or four people. We're, we're attempting to do it with two people and collect the information that we need. So it's been an interesting process. We've learned a lot uh, and probably learned some efficiencies as far as doing some of these surveys, maybe with less staff moving on in the future. But um, we, we've, been, we've been doing what we can during this time. We've got a lot of, we have a lot of the stuff that's been accomplished during this year. Any, any specific questions anybody has on that on my very brief update? to keep us on track. Bob. Thanks, Brad. Just a quick question. I've talked to Cheryl. I think I talked to you too. Um, we just spent $30 million-ish on Kettle Marine Springs. Why hasn't the people, I mean, we were told we couldn't ask for a fee increase because there was $30 million in, a, in an account, which we knew was for Kettle Marine Springs. Kettle Marine Springs is done. It's raising fish. Everything's cool. We haven't seen any pictures. We haven't seen any stories, but the money's been spent. Mm -hmm. uh, why is there, I'm missing something. <laughs> why can't we tell the people it's done? You mean like uh, a press release or? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, I, I'll have to look into that, Bob. 
Thank you. I'll, I'll let you know. I'll let you. I'll let, every, I'll let, I'll let Titus know. Appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Anything else out there? All right. Well, next we're going to move on to Nick Legler. He's going to be giving you an update on an angler survey that he's been working on and we'll be sending out to primarily Lake Michigan anglers that are purchasing salmon stamps. So with that, I'll give it over to Nick. Okay, thanks, Brad. Uh, just to confirm, is, is everything sharing okay with my screen here? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, great. So as Brad said, my name is Nick Legler. I work as a fisheries biologist with the DNR up in Sturgeon Bay. And today I will provide just some, some very basic and quick updates on an upcoming Lake Michigan angler survey. Um, the survey was just recently developed and overall should provide some really good opportunity for anglers to provide feedback uh, specifically on Lake Michigan salmonid fisheries. So again, my update today is going to be pretty quick. I have seven pretty basic slides that simply will describe the kind of the what, the why, the when, and the how uh, was this Lake Michigan Angler Survey developed. So just very generally, uh, public feedback, you know, coming from anglers, constituents, you know, stakeholder groups is, is certainly a, a very important component of fisheries management. And without a doubt, it's, it's an extremely important component of Lake Michigan fisheries management. And you know, to date, we have a lot of very well-established and, and very successful methods that we've used to engage the public. Um, just some examples, you know, the Lake Michigan Fisheries Forum, you know, public meetings, public comment periods. There's a lot of different approaches that we have and we will continue to use. But we really have never done kind of a, a more formal kind of comprehensive angler survey. Um, and, and just for some clarification there, you know, we have in the past done some smaller scale kind of informal um, Lake Michigan questionnaires. Um, these are normally pretty short, basic um, questionnaires that have been distributed kind of on a small scale at past public meetings. Um, but what I'm kind of getting at here is that we, we really haven't done a, any, a much more comprehensive formal survey um, that's been developed not only with fisheries management um, input, but, but also with input from social scientists. Um, and, and that's what this survey here is, is going to try to do. So just to provide some, I guess, real world examples, um, many of you are probably familiar with the economic survey that was conducted for Green Bay anglers. Um, I believe this was a year, year or two ago. Um, results of that survey were shared with the Lake Michigan Fisheries Forum. Um, additionally, there's, there's been a recent survey in, in southern Wisconsin um, that targeted anglers in the southern part of the state. Um, upcoming, there, there's going to be a walleye and a panfish surveys that, that go out across the state. Uh, but again, there really hasn't been one for Lake Michigan. Um, so just, just some additional background info. Um, DNR Fisheries Management um, had a statewide training session back in, in March. Um, this was right before COVID hit, so it was actually an in-person meeting held down in the Dells. And at that meeting, there was a social scientist, Bob Holzman, uh, who gave a very good presentation on stakeholder engagement. And uh, among the many things that he discussed, one of them was the, the use of a formal stakeholder survey to help gather feedback from anglers. And uh, from that, this, this idea kind of sparked that, that maybe we should do this for Lake Michigan, and since it's, it's developed. So um, the survey itself was developed largely with DNR's fisheries management policy team. Um, and I became involved largely because I, I served as a member at large on the policy team for about four months earlier this year. And then certainly uh, DNR social scientists, um, particularly Bob Holzman and Lauren Bradshaw, um, Lauren especially have, have played really big roles in developing this, this angler survey. So, what is the purpose of the survey and why are we doing it? Um, the purpose is simply to better understand angler behaviors, awareness, and opinions regarding Wisconsin DNR salmonid management on Lake Michigan. Um, 
again, we have a lot of very well established um, past and ongoing methods for public outreach. Um, and these all remain extremely important. Um, they have and will continue. Um, but this survey is just kind of a, another method that we hope to use to efficiently and effectively um, engage anglers and, and get additional feedback um, from the people that are out there fishing the lake. So when and how will the survey be distributed? Um, the, the survey itself uh, will be going out later this week and it, it will be an online survey conducting using Survey SurveyMonkey and it will be distributed via email. Um, so we actually took um, a, a random selection of 5,500 anglers um, that were, were pulled from DNR's Go Wild um, licensing record system. Um, so we, we pulled these from two different sets of anglers. One was Great Lakes salmon and trout stamp anglers that were purchased during 2020. And then we also pulled the list from two day Great Lakes fishing licenses also purchased during 2020. Um, and it will be going to both resident and non-resident anglers. Um, so again, a, a random sample of, you know, a, a pretty large uh, set of anglers that will be getting the survey. And then what exactly will the survey entail? Um, overall, there are 36 questions that will be asked on the survey. And I, I won't go into the specifics of the questions today, but just to give you a general idea, um, the, the questions are divided up into five primary uh, sections. So it, it looks at general experiences uh, fishing in Wisconsin. Um, it will look at Lake Michigan salmon and trout fishing experiences, focusing specifically on the recent 2020 season, um, angler preferences, uh, fisheries management and science. And then the last section is, is simply information about you, uh, information about the angler. So overall, you know, we, we touch on a lot of different topics within the survey and hope to gather a, a lot of really useful information and feedback from, from anglers. So lastly, when will the results be available? Uh, we expect to have preliminary results available from the survey by February, 2020. So a pretty quick turnaround. Um, these results will be analyzed and summarized by uh, DNR social scientists. Um, again, Lauren Bradshaw from Madison is, is playing a big role in, in developing the survey and, and will also help out with, with summarizing and analyzing the results. And overall, I, I really look forward to seeing the results and, and then ultimately sharing them with the group once they, once they become available. So in, in conclusion, I'm pretty excited about the survey. I think it's, it's gonna be another great opportunity to gather um, a lot of really useful feedback from anglers. Um, there are 5,500 anglers again that will be receiving the survey randomly. Um, there's a possibility that, that people in this group here tonight will be getting the survey. Um, and if, if you do, I, I certainly encourage you to participate in the survey and we'll thank anybody in advance for, for any feedback that they'll be able to provide to provide. So again, that was fairly quick, um, but I, I just wanted to give a, the group a heads up um, on that survey. And if there are any questions or comments, um, I think we do have a little bit of time for that. Thanks, Nick. Any questions for Nick on his uh, angler survey? Hey, Nick. Uh, yep, Bob. Yeah, just a quick question. Conservation patrons, were they included? Um, I believe so. I, I didn't have it listed here, um, but I, I know in the discussions that I had with the social scientists that we did discuss the conservation patrons. So um, it, it was acknowledged and, I, and I'll have to double check with the social scientists to, to see if they were included. It's my belief that there's a bigger bigger population of people that buy conservation patron licenses just to buy, have everything inclusive than what's understood at times. Sure. Yep, Thank I you. can check on that. Thank you. Any other questions for Nick? All right, that could be exciting to see the results when you get them in. Thanks, Nick. Next, we'll move on to a presentation, I believe, on early detection and monitoring efforts for aquatic invasive species in Lake Michigan. Um, who do we tab for this uh, presentation here?
Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Brad. Um, I, I don't know if there was a, a miscommunication with Carrie Ann and um, if anyone from the Fish and Wildlife Service is planning to give that talk, uh, let me know. And otherwise, uh, we will have to save that for a later date. Okay. Well, um, either Susan or maybe Chuck can give us a heads up on that if we're going to move on to Matt. Hey, Brad, it's Susan. Um, my apologies. I know she ended up going out into the field over in Michigan this week last minute, um, but I'm not sure what's going on. My, my apologies for that. I'll just move on to Matt. Okay. All right, moving on to Matt, who is the keeper of our uh, mass marking information. It looks like we'll be talking about lake trout movement and wild recruitment in Lake Michigan. That's right. <laughs> be able to share your screen, Matt? Yes, I'm working on that. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I was doing a dry run and then I heard my name called. So, <laughs> um, let us share the screen and we'll try that screen there. And then I'll go to slideshow mode. Let's see. Is everybody able to see the, the PowerPoint? see it. Yep. Okay, excellent. Um, so feel free to interrupt if uh, the technology fails us here. But um, yeah. All right. So um, thanks for, for tuning in. Um, I'm my, my name is Matt. I'm with the US Fish and Wildlife Service at the Green Bay Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office. I'm working with the Great Lakes Mass Marking Program, which I suspect many of the audience are familiar with. Um, we do a lot of work with salmon and trout in the Great Lakes. And uh, as, as Brad mentioned tonight, I'm gonna to be focusing on the lake trout study. Uh, I'm gonna to try to move this over so that I can um, look at the presentation camera. I guess that's, that's just not, I, I'm not gonna be able to do that. So uh, if I'm not looking at the camera, it's because I'm looking at my slides. Um, and so uh, lake trout movement and wild recruitment, that's, that's gonna be the topic tonight. Um, so just some, some brief background here on, on lake trout. Um, Lake trout have been the focus of rehabilitation efforts in Lake Michigan since the 1960s. Uh, I have a figure here um, that uh, shows the yield, uh, the commercial harvest of lake trout prior to the 1950 uh, collapse in the, in the uh, many of the Great Lakes. This, uh, this rehabilitation effort has been built on stocking, uh, harvest regulations, and sea lamprey control. And uh, the, the two things we're talking about tonight are pretty central to um, the rehabilitation effort. First, uh, updated movement data on lake trout are needed um, for stock assessment models and also for a study that's helping us understand the genetic origin of wild fish in the lake. Um, and then second, the relative abundance of wild lake trout recruits. We estimate this annually to help monitor progress towards rehabilitation. So um, with that, a, a very simple outline um, focusing on movement first. That's going to be the bulk of the talk um, and following that up with wild recruitment. So um, our partners for the lake trout movement study include many of the agencies around the lake, uh, all those that participate in the lakewide assessment plan um, or LWOP, that's the spring gillnet surveys um, from which many of these fish were recovered. That includes all four states as well as the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians, the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa Indians and the Little Traverse Bay Band of Ottawa Indians, as well as the, the USGS. Um, and we also received some pretty good feedback from the modeling subcommittee, from the, the technical fisheries committee. So I'm, I'm highlighting Mark Ebner, um, Rick Clark, Steve Lenart, and Dave Carafino um, for their contributions to this as well. So um, movement uh, among interconnected regions is a pretty important thing for understanding and assessing fishery stocks. And this is exemplified here um, by Atlantic salmon uh, migration patterns in the Atlantic Ocean, where they, they migrate annually um, thousands of miles between sp spawning and feeding grounds. Um, so while lake trout are moving on a much smaller scale than that, uh, their movements are still important for understanding the fishery. And lake trout movement was last assessed in 2003. Um, almost 20 years ago, uh, but this particular analysis relied pretty heavily on assumptions from the literature because at that point in time, only fish that were stocked at a few um, uh, priority sites received tags. So 
Um, since then, uh, starting in 2010, all hatchery lake trout released into Lakes Michigan and Huron have received a coated wire tag um, from the Great Lakes Nest Marking Program, and this has allowed this fresh evaluation of movement. So with this study, we had two main objectives. Um, first, to estimate the percentage of lake trout moving among statistical districts post-release um, from all of the, the mass mark cohorts, which was the 2010 year class uh, forward. And then to look at uh, the origin of lake trout harvested in different areas of the lake. Um, so it's, it's kind of looking at two sides of the same coin. We're, we're looking at movement data in both instances. Uh, the first objective relates to uh, uh, how fish are moving relative to where they were stocked. The second is how they're moving with relation to where they were landed. Um, so for all of this, the tagging and tag extraction, um, bread and butter, the mass marking program uh, plays a, a pretty key role here. The uh, hatchery fish are receiving adipose fin clips um, to identify them as hatchery fish, as well as coated wire tags. And, and this is done using an automated system that tags fish between seven and 10,000 uh, fish per hour, which is about uh, two or three fish every second. Um, we have uh, several photos here showing the exterior of the trailer on the top left, uh, the interior on the lower right. Um, and then kind of on the top right there, you see these, these tags are really small. They're a fraction of a fraction of an inch, only one millimeter long. Um, and then the, the lab process of, of extracting and reading those tags. So the, the reason why these tag data are so useful for a movement study is that they provide a data on the stocking location. And then we have data on the recovery location. Between the two of those things, we can have some estimate of movement. Um, the tags also give us information on the year class and the genetic strain of these fish. So since 2010, all lake trout released in Lakes Michigan and Huron have received a tag for between 3.8 uh, 3 and 6.3 million fish annually. And then the recovered tags are hand extracted from samples um, collected by the gillnet and sport fish surveys. So um, with regards specifically to movement for sampling and tag recovery, um, when we looked at the spatial coverage of available data, we, we saw that the fishery independent surveys, the spring LWOP surveys, um, and the sport fishery data from the mass marking program complemented each other in terms of spatial coverage. And so as a result, we evaluated data from both of these sources. We also um, conducted analyses on catch that had been corrected for effort, um, which is another way of measuring relative abundance and uh, thus gives us a sense of movement um, more or less independent from, from differences in effort in different areas of the world. <clears throat> the, uh, First sampling and, and tag recovery method that we're talking about here is the fishery independent surveys. Um, we have a map here on the right showing the sampling locations and these red dots. Um, and then this is a survey that's been conducted annually since 1998 um, by multiple agencies that coordinate to annually assess and sample lake trout. Uh, we use graded mesh gill nets that stretch from um, eight different increments and are set on bottom every spring. And for the movement study, we had data on a little over 8,500 coated wire tag lake trout from the mass mark cohorts. Um, so what we can see here on this map, this does have pretty good coverage in the lake. Um, some notable gaps include the area by Racine, Kenosha, um, Indiana waters, and then that area between Algoma and Sheboygan and the Wisconsin shoreline. Um, and these are areas where we happen to have a fair bit of data from the sport fishery. Um, so that's part of what, uh, how these two data sources complement each other. Uh, on the flip side, the sport fishery, obviously we don't have any data from the two refuges and we do have data from these independent surveys from those refuges. So um, with regards to the sport fishery survey, this is again, uh, this is part of the mass marking program. Um, so in order to get data on all the, the tagged fish, we need to be able to see those tags um, uh, as recovered from the open water fishery. And so this is an extensive field survey. It's been coordinated by Fish and Wildlife and the, the state partners since 2012. We have six teams every year that sample 40 ports, um, more or less, um, over the course of the year and cover about 400, 450 sampling days cumulatively. Um, the map on the right here is showing all the different uh, ports that we sample in blue with our six field stations in red stars. Um, all told, every year we've seen between 15,000 and 22,000 fish, um, which amounts to between three and 6,000 lake trout. And so from this survey, we had a little over 4,600 coated wire tag lake trout. Um, so all told, this movement data is being informed by a little over 13,000 fish. 
So um, moving on from the methodologies here, um, first objective to estimate per percentage of lake trout moving among statistical districts post-release. I'm just gonna go through a series of maps um, showing you these results. And so to orient you to these figures, um, in each map, you're going to see an area highlighted in yellow. This represents the area of the lake where the lake trout were stocked. Um, so in this left map, you're seeing lake trout that were stocked within the northern refuge. On the right map, you're seeing lake trout that were stocked in um, non-refuge waters of MM3. The percentage values are showing um, the percentage of fish stocked in that yellow area um, that moved or were recovered in different areas of the lake. And so they summed to 100% um, plus or minus 1% due to rounding over the course of the entire map. So um, some things that we learned here, uh, if we start with the Northern Refuge, we see a little over a third of those fish, 36% um, were recovered within the refuge. Um, this provides some indication of what proportion those fish are um, being protected from exploitation because they're remaining in a refuge. Um, we see about a quarter of the fish moving towards the Manistique area and the tip of the Door Peninsula, a quarter of the fish moving east into um, the rest of MM3, and then the remaining fish moving southward in Lake Michigan, um, mostly being recovered in the area near, um, I'd say, north of Sheboygan through Sturgeon Bay and then the, the similar uh, area of the lake on the Michigan shore. Uh, on the right map, we're looking at fish stocked in non-refuge area of MM3. Um, and you can see uh, right away here that those fish are a little more localized in their importance with about three quarters being recovered in that same area of the lake. Um, and this was a pretty common pattern. If we look at fish that were stocked in nearshore locations, those lake trout were pretty localized in their importance. Um, the overwhelming majority being recovered either in the district where they were stocked or in an adjacent district. Whereas our three offshore locations, that'd be the Northern Refuge, the Southern Refuge, and then Illinois, which is mostly Julian's Reef, um, fish stocked at those three locations had a little more broad dispersal, um, which we'll see um, shortly. So um, moving southward from Northern Lake Michigan, on the left, we have fish stocked in Grand Traverse Bay. Um, it's not really a surprise to see that most of those fish were recovered in Grand Traverse Bay. That's something we see even with the Chinook salmon, which move a fair bit more than lake trout. Even with Chinook, the uh, Grand Traverse Bay is the exception to the rule. Um, and so here with lake, with lake trout, we do see pretty much the um, nearly all those fish being recovered there with a handful being recovered in Northern Lake Michigan outside of the bay. Um, on the right hand map, we're looking at fish stuck in MM5. This is the area of the lake near the port of Frankfurt. Um, and one thing we noticed here and with the, the uh, several other Michigan nearshore districts is that, again, most of those fish are being recovered um, where they were stocked or in adjacent units, but, but the fish tended to have more of a southward movement. Um, so in this case, we see about half the fish recovered in MM5, only 11% of those that left, 11% uh, went northward, whereas about 40% went southward, um, predominantly in the area near Ludington and, and then Muskegon, um, but a little bit being recovered even further south than that. This uh, tendency towards southward movement um, continued for fish stocked in MM6. This is the area near Ludington and is shown on the left-hand side. Um, roughly a third were recovered there. Again, 11% uh, recovered northward and the remaining of the fish uh, uh, being recovered southward. Um, fish stocked in MM7 and 8. So we didn't have discrete tag lots for those two units. And so they had to be combined as one stocking unit. And uh, with a unit so large, it's not a surprise we saw about 80% of the fish recovered there. Um, and even here, we do see that southward tendency with more fish being recovered south in Indiana than northward along the Michigan coast. I, I don't really know why that is, but that's, that's a pattern we saw, um, as you see, pretty consistently for these, these districts on the Michigan shoreline. Um, so now if we uh, look at the, the far southern end of the lake, on the left we're looking at fish stocked in Illinois. Uh, the vast majority of these fish are stocked at Julian's Reef. Um, because that's a little bit offshore, we think that's why we see a little bit more broad dispersal for fish stocked there. Um, even so, you're looking at about two-thirds um, of the fish being recovered in the southern basin, um, whereas uh, another third then is moving, moving more northward in the lake. Um, the right hand side, we see fish stocked in Indiana. Um, and again, this is about as far south as it gets. So the fish that didn't stay did move northward. Uh, but we're still seeing, uh, you know, here we're looking at um, close to 90% in the southern, southern three districts of the lake. 
And then uh, finally, if we look at the lake trout stocked on the southern refuge, um, first and foremost, we see that a little more than half of those fish were recovered there on the southern refuge. As we'll learn a little later on, this is being driven by uh, a particular strain of fish that's stocked out there. The, the humper ecomorphotype, the Klondike fish, do not really move off the southern refuge. Um, other fish that are stocked out there are from the Seneca Lake strain, and they are the ones that are mostly responsible for the movement outside of the refuge. Uh, we do see, however, that the fish that do move off that refuge are pretty broadly dispersed throughout the southern two-thirds of the Lake Michigan Basin. So um, it, you might notice we didn't really talk about fish stocked in Wisconsin waters. That's in part because uh, we haven't had any lake trout stocked in Wisconsin waters for the last couple of years. Um, we did go back to the 2010 year class, so we did see some, uh, but of, of those, we only recovered a total of 16 fish. Um, that were stocked in Nearshore, Wisconsin waters. And so I, I didn't think uh, there was a lot of confidence in those data. I don't have a map. Uh, just to summarize, we had a little more than half recovered in Wisconsin and the other half in Indiana. Um, again, we're talking about a total of 16 fish here. So um, not much on Nearshore, Wisconsin waters. So what are some general interpretations of these data? So first, um, if we compare the present data informed by tags um, to the, the old data, um, we do see some notable differences uh, in areas where tag data were previously unavailable. So the example I have here is the fish stock in MM5. Um, on the right hand side, we see the data from the Elliott 2003 study that previously looked at this. Um, based on literature values, the, that study assumed about half of those fish would remain where they were stocked, and then a quarter of each would move into the adjacent districts. Um, what we've learned from the tagging data is this southward tendency. If we look at that, that same district stocked in MM5, um, we do see about 50% staying there, but the, the fish that left did not do so in an equal proportion um, north and south. Um, the good news is if we look at areas where we did have tag data, um, that would be the, the two refuges, um, we do see that the results were pretty consistent between these studies. So the, the left shows the 2020 data for fish stocked in the northern refuge, the right shows fish stocked in the northern refuge um, from the 20. Uh, 2003 analysis. And uh, without going into the, the nitty gritty percentages, you can see overall, we're looking at about the same results with about a third staying within the, the refuge. Um, and then most of those fish remaining in Northern Lake Michigan with some traveling further south. So um, to sum this up in terms of dispersal distances, I've got a figure here that shows um, lake trout that were stocked at the three units that had the most dispersal. That'd be the Northern Refuge in purple, the Southern Refuge in blue, and Illinois in yellow, um, which is again, Julian's Reef. Um, what you're looking at here is the, the total proportion of lake trout represented as you have more distance um, from stocking location along the x-axis. So um, eventually the, these lines all plateau at one, so you get 100% of the catch um, within a certain distance. And so to summarize all this, if we take a dashed line from uh, about 60 miles um, from the stocking location, this intersects the proportion um, at, uh, uh, for all three of these within the same area, we can boil this figure down as saying, between 72 and 82% of the lake trout stocked at these three areas were recovered within 62 miles of where they were stocked. And these are the three areas that had the most dispersal. So this gives us a, a reasonable estimate of dispersal distance for lake trout. It's pretty consistent with prior tagging studies on lake trout in other lakes. Um, and it shows that lake trout do are, are pretty mobile um, in the grand scheme of things, but not compared to some of the salmon that are stocked in Lake Michigan, like Chinook salmon, and we think steelhead are, are moving a bit more than this. So um, moving on to the origin of lake trout harvested in different areas of the lake. Um, this is trying to look at what uh, is comprising anglers catch. And so here I'll start with um, lake trout that were landed by anglers in Wisconsin waters. Um, for this figure, you're looking at the percent of lake trout from each origin location. Um, we're gonna have the Northern Refuge in blue, Southern Refuge in black, um, Illinois in green, and then near shore waters, which are predominantly Michigan, but some Indiana waters as well in this kind of orange yellow. Um, so what we see in Wisconsin is that the vast majority of fish are from one of these three offshore locations, um, between 80 and 90% or so, um, depending on the recovery unit. 
Um, and we're going from north to south as we look at the re recovery unit. So WM3 is this area by Sturgeon Bay. Um, WM4 is like the Manitowoc area. WM5 is Sheboygan, Milwaukee. WM6 is Racine, Kenosha. Um, and so we see the contribution of fish from the northern refuge more or less decline as we get farther south in the lake um, with pretty steady contributions from the southern refuge and, and Illinois waters. Um, recovery patterns in Illinois and Indiana were pretty similar. Um, and then if we look at Michigan waters where most of those near shore fish are stocked, it's not a surprise that we start to see a greater proportion coming from um, near shore locations, particularly in MM3, 4, 5, and 6, which are probably the most heavily stocked in near shore areas um, of the, the 1836 treaty waters. Um, even so, we do see in Michigan waters uh, pretty important contributions from the northern refuge in the northern units of MM2 and 3, and important contributions from the southern refuge in MM6, 7, and 8. So um, when looking at these data, you know, the, the first instinct is to say, well, yeah, we're, we're seeing lots of fish recovered from these offshore locations because lots of fish are stocked there. And while that's true to a certain extent, we actually do see the same pattern when we correct uh, and present these data at per unit stocked. Um, so this is the, the same data shown uh, for lake trout catch per 100,000 fish stocked. Um, we have uh, the graph summarized for Lake Michigan on the left and then each of the states as we move towards the right. Um, those offshore locations are represented by the blue colors. Julian's Reef first um, had the highest return rate in each state and uh, uh, Southern Refuge second, second highest in each state. Um, and then uh, um, we can see some contributions from the Northern Refuge as well. Um, but uh, at that point, we do see more from, from near shore waters in certain areas of the lake, particularly Michigan and Indiana. Uh, but what this is telling us is that the, the fact that we're seeing lots of lake trout that were stocked offshore in angler catch, it's not just because there's a lot of fish stocked off there, it's because there appears to be some sort of difference in the return rate um, that could be uh, attributed potentially to differences in survival. It, you know, these offshore locations, we are talking about stocking fish in high priority areas that are historically important spawning habitat, um, really good habitat for lake trout. Um, they're offshore, they're protected from exploitation. It, it would, shouldn't be a surprise that they would survive at a, at a greater rate than fish that are stocked near shore. And then those fish that do move near shore um, become vulnerable to anglers and are representing a fairly sizable proportion of angler catch. Um, something else we've learned from these movement data is that the, the, the two refuges in the lake appear to be acting as sources for other districts. Um, so these two maps uh, on the left, we have fish stocked in the northern refuge on the right. Um, fish stocked in the southern refuge. In this case, the percentages don't sum to 100 across the map. That's because they represent the percentage of fish within each unit that were stocked in the northern refuge on the left and were stocked in the southern refuge on the right. And what I've done here is highlighted the percentages that were more than 14% in red. Um, so that gives you this visual depiction. If you combine the two maps um, in, in your minds, you can see that these two refuges do provide a fair amount of fish that are recovered um, by anglers lake wide. So um, with regards to the movement data, so one caveat here, the preliminary evidence from coded wire tags from the late 90s and 2000s suggested that movement rates tend to increase with older fish up until about age 12. And this particular study, uh, all fish in this analysis were age seven or less, with most being age four to six. That's just an, by virtue of the fact of when we started tagging fish again. Um, so there is a reanalysis planned in about five years. Um, when data from mass marked fish ages four through 13 would be available, this uh, would likely result in a little bit higher dispersal than what we're seeing here um, if the preliminary evidence from legacy tags proves to be accurate. So um, what I want to do next is just highlight three different research applications of these movement data. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that they're needed to help update stock assessment models. Um, one of the more recent efforts was to, to start looking at uh, stock assessments in the non-treaty waters of Lake Michigan, um, which has been spearheaded by Rick Clark and a number of others. Um, so these movement data um, helped them to establish st these stock assessment units, um, which are the two light gray ones here in this map. Um, 
help to estimate movement among the stock assessment units in the lake. And that in turn is incorporated into the models that estimate annual mortality, which is uh, shown in this figure as A. Um, these are preliminary data uh, showing a little bit higher mortality in northeastern Lake Michigan than southwestern Lake Michigan. Um, so that's, that's one aspect that these movement data has proved really helpful. Um, I mentioned strain specific dispersal. So this is the actual data showing the differences in movement for two strains stocked in the southern refuge. Um, we did not see a whole lot of difference among most of the genetic strains in terms of their dispersal. But um, for the superior Klondike strain, this is a, a humper ecomorpha type um, that in, the, in their native range in Lake Superior are known to sort of hang around reefs or humps, hence the humper phrase. Um, and uh, at least in their native range, they're not known for a lot of movement. And it's, we've kind of seen that here as well. Um, so the, the circles here are proportional to the, the uh, percentage of catch for fish uh, stocked. And in, in long story short, only 3% of those Klondikes were recovered off the Southern Refuge. So they were pretty stationary. Um, by contrast, the Seneca Lake fish that were stocked out there, um, about three quarters were actually recovered off the refuge. So much more mobile um, and being recovered throughout the Southern two thirds of the basin. Um, so uh, when you combine these two, that's how you get that, that map we showed earlier with about a little more than half staying on the refuge and a little less than half moving off. And then finally, I mentioned at the beginning that these movement data were going to be used to help with um, an analysis of genetics of wild recruits. Um, this was a recently accepted study uh, led by Wes Larson, who is formerly uh, of Stevens Point. Um, what we used the movement data for here was to um, account for movement when developing our expected proportions based on stocking numbers. And what we're seeing here in this figure is a heat map showing the proportion of fish um, from each of these genetic strains to wild recruits um, relative to what would be expected from their stocking numbers. Uh, warmer colors represent uh, a, a larger amount of fish than would be expected. And so what we learned from this study is that the Seneca Lake uh, genetic strain, um, you see all those red colors, that, that suggests that there's a disproportionately high contribution of Seneca Lake um, to wild recruitment than would be expected from their proportions. Um, we also learned that the Lewis Lake strain, which is that second column, there was a, a little bit more than expected um, for uh, Lewis Lake contributions. And then the Green Lake strain and the three strains from Lake Superior had a disproportionately lower um, amount of wild recruitment than would be expected. Um, I want to note that for the superior strains, this doesn't include that Klondike Humper strain that was stocked so recently that we didn't have any data from that strain in terms of um, uh, potential kind of contributions to wild recruits. They would have wouldn't have been mature enough to contribute. Same could be said for the Huron Perry strain, um, and so that's why those two strains are not really included in this study. So um, with that, that's the vast majority of what I'm going to talk about, but I do want to um, just take a quick side tangent here to talk a little bit about lake trout wild recruitment. Um, this is something we look at annually um, so that we can have a better understanding of the relative contribution of hatchery and wild fish. Um, so we have a fish image here that has all of its fin, fins intact. This would be a fish that would be presumed to be of wild recruitment. Um, wild uh, production. Since, since 2010, um, all of the hatchery fish have received an adipose fin clip and a coated wire tag. And lake trout are fairly long lived, so we actually do have um, a lot of uh, older fish that we still see in the fishery. And yeah, but they've been receiving fin clips since, um, you know, since the early days. And so um, in this case, you know, we could see um, potential clips on a number of other fins and even on the, the maxilla here. Um, and so as a result, because of these rotational fin clips pre-2010 and the 80 coated wire tag clips post-2010, we can get a good handle on, on lake trout that are wild or from a hatchery. And so I'm showing you here a, a figure of sport fishery returns from 2019, which is the latest data we have. Um, and uh, overall, we saw about 38% of the lake trout in Lake Michigan were wild. Um, if you look at the map carefully, you'll see the values are much higher in the southern two thirds of the lake than in the north. A um, couple different factors for this. Uh, mortality tends to be higher in the north from sea lamprey predation as well as commercial fishing and recreational fishing. Um, we 
uh, also see about two thirds of the fish are being wild in, in Lake Huron based on their sport fishery survey. Um, I wanna point out that in the spring gillnet assessments, we see, I think the latest report was about 21% wild fish lake wide. Um, when we looked at the data, we realized that the, for whatever reason in the sport fishery, we had more lake trout that were of smaller sizes. Um, and so those fish are uh, given a positive trajectory in wild recruitment, we'd likely see more wild fish from younger, smaller sizes. Um, and I think that is largely explaining the discrepancy uh, between the fishery independent and sport fishery sources. But on the whole, if you look at both of those data sources, we have seen a positive trajectory in lake trout recruitment. Um, so some examples here, if we, again, looking strictly at the, the sport fishery survey, this is a figure showing the percentage of wild lake trout in our survey data from 2014 through 2019. Um, we see steady improvements in that number in Lake Huron. Um, and then in Lake, Southern Lake Michigan, starting in 2016, we've seen that number climb. And then in 2019, we saw kind of the first um, deviation from baseline in Northern Lake Michigan. Um, not sure yet if that's a trend or just a blip on the radar there. Um, and uh, if we look at the catch per unit effort, we, we know that this is being driven by wild production and not just um, a reduction in hatchery fish. So this, this next figure is actually showing wild lake trout catch per unit effort in the sport fishery. We see those same uh, positive trajectories um, overall in Lake Huron and Southern Lake Michigan. Um, with that 2019 blip for, for Northern Lake Michigan. So um, this is very positive news for lake trout. Um, it's not quite at the point where based on management benchmarks, we are ready to declare victory more or less. Uh, we're, I don't think we're quite at a point where we have a self-sustaining population. If you look at some of the management benchmarks for abundance and age cohorts and whatnot, um, but it's, it's very promising to see um, this, uh, this improvement for wild recruitment of lake trout. So um, to close here, just a few take home points uh, before fielding questions. Um, we saw for movement and for whatever reason, this is not showing the, the header, but uh, for movement, we see that lake trout were usually recovered within about 60 miles where they were stocked. And that would include the district where they were stocked in the adjacent units. Um, there it is. So uh, dispersal was similar among all the strains, except for the superior Klondike humper morph. Um, that appeared to rarely move away from their stocking location. Um, we saw that the offshore refuges are protecting some fish from like exploitation and are sources of lake trout for near shore areas. Um, and we've seen how these results are being used in stock assessment models, um, evaluation of rehabilitation strategies, assessment of strain specific dispersals, uh, and a study on the genetic origin of wild lake trout. Um, with regards to wild recruitment, um, we see that the wild recruitment of lake trout appears to be improving, especially in southern Lake Michigan, but not yet at target levels for self-sustainability. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their attention, and I'd be happy to field any questions. Thanks, Matt. Any questions for Matt on lake trout? Bob. Matt. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is blessed to have a boat to, f to stock fish offshore. Um, how many of the lake trout are stocked offshore and at what time of day are they stocked? Well, um, I know uh, I would say the majority are probably stocked offshore at this point. I mean, we have um, over a million fish going into the northern, ref northern Lake Michigan alone. I guess I don't know how many of those are on refuge versus not. Um, I guess without having the spreadsheet in front of me, it, it's, I would say maybe 50, 50, give or take 10% either way. I, I don't really know what time of day they're stocked. I don't know if um, Susan or Chuck might be able to shed light on that. So, so they mostly are stocked during the day. Okay. So the, the, the boats are usually loaded very early in the morning. Um, and the offshore runs are, you know, 35, 40 miles off. And so when they get there, it's daylight um, because the way the vessel, the stocking vessels um, <clears throat> uh, built and designed, as soon as uh, there's 10 1,000 gallon tanks on board the stocking vessel, uh, and those are on deck. And when, once that uh, valve is open to dump them into the, over the side, those fish hit the water and they disappear. Okay, so it's not like 
you know, a stocking event you would see with a hatchery truck at a, at a uh, marina or something. It's very different. Uh, so, um, so you're concerned, Bob, about uh, uh, bird mortality and things like that, right? Aerial this, predation, correct. Yeah, this minimizes that. That's, that's why we, we, des we designed the vessel that way. It, I don't know whether you know about our old stocking vessel. <laughs> they had the tanks and the lazarette <laughs> underneath the deck and, the, and then a fish pump moving them up and over the side. Uh, this is infinitely better, <laughs> okay. as you can imagine. And I'm going to have to guess that your vessel, as it's going out, doesn't have a trail of uh, seagulls and cormorants as, as you would see from a commercial fishing vessel coming into port. <laughs> not, not unless somebody's dressing fish on the back deck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just so you know, I mean, I mean, these vessels, the vessels are uh, they're, um, equipped with chilled water and oxygen concentrators and everything. So these fish, this is about as good as it gets, Bob. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. You answered my question right to the point. Thank you. Yeah, I know what you were getting at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, go ahead, Jerry. Uh, yeah, Matt, a couple questions for you. One, uh, you had said 38% uh, is where you think your natural recruitment is right now. Um, yeah, that's so that's based on the sport fishery data. Um, like I said, uh, the other source of those data, the the um, spring gillnet assessments, they have an estimate of about 21%. So you could, I guess, use those as endpoints um, in terms of lake wide wild, wild uh, recruitment to the percentage of fish that were wild. Um, and it's being driven by the southern southern basin. We, we don't see as much uh, wild fish in the north. Okay, and then what is your benchmark uh, percentage? that you're looking to obtain or to, to get to? Yeah, so if you if you look at the, um, the, the management targets, the percentage of wild fish actually is not one of the benchmarks we look at. Um, we're looking at the um, catch per unit effort of, of fish in the spring and then again in the fall in terms of spawning stock biomass. Um, so you're looking at certain thresholds of, I believe, 25 and 50 fish per thousand feet of gill net for those two assessments. Um, those are two of the benchmarks. Um, there's another benchmark looking at uh, the age cohorts of the spawning stock, looking to have um, at least, uh, I think it's seven or 10 cohorts that are at least seven years old. Um, lake trout uh, tend to have a much stronger likelihood of wild recruitment if you have a robust um, amount of uh, uh, parental stock of, of varying ages. And, and lake trout don't start to reproduce until about age six or seven in the lake at the earliest. Um, so those are the management benchmarks we're looking at. Um, that said, you know, I, I, like I said, there, there's not a management benchmark for a percentage of wild fish, but um, you know, I, I'd say that we, we started seeing increases in wild fish only three or four years ago in most of the lake. Um, so, you know, consistent with the fact that those other management targets haven't been met, um, we're still looking to hopefully see a little bit more uh, sustained wild recruitment. Um, you know, again, before we would declare victory. Okay, and one other question for you. Do you have uh, your stocking numbers for 2021 for Lake Michigan? Um, I believe we do, but I don't know what they are offhand. Is there any way to get oh. that information? I, 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 yeah, I believe we could get you that information. Um, do you have a, a way to contact you after the fact? Um, actually, so Susan's telling me, telling everyone, yes. Susan, do you know those numbers offhand or? I do not have them in front of me, but I, I do have um, the spreadsheet and everything. So I can uh, send that to somebody who can share it with interested parties. I think they're, I think they're very similar to the number yes. of fish that went in. Yes. Uh, this year, minus minus fish destined for the Mid Lake Reef. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I, I can I can get I can get those, or you can send them to Titus, and he can route it around to the Fisheries yeah. Forum group. Yeah, that would be great if we could get them. Mm -hmm. That would be awesome. Hey, Jerry Chuck yeah. Monte, just yep. just want to reinforce what Matt said about the target for wild fish. Yes. I mean, really, I mean, the only time we would start worrying about too many wild fish as if we saw would be to inform us when we should pull back 
on stocking hatchery fish. The okay. intent of the, of the program is to get mostly wild fish out there. Right. You know, the lake is a better hatchery than the br brick and mortar that we got here. I would you know? agree. Yep. So, so, so yeah, uh, if you want to, the brass ring is a hundred percent wild fish and right. do something else with the hatcheries. Okay. Um, can I just ask one dumb question for you? So there's been numerous fish that I caught lake trout fishing this year out of Sheboygan um, with different clips. Um, is there any way to find out or get me some information as to what the different fin clips mean, if, whether that's date, whether that's yeah. uh, where they came from? Yeah. Um, I'm just yeah. curious because I've had them with uh, the lip cut already. I've had um, adipose fins missing. I've had half of uh, dorsal fins missing and so yeah. on. So. Yeah, so, so the, uh, yeah, so before, before um, well, just so you know, ever since the lake trout stocking program began, we did mass marking, but the mass marking was done with fin clips. And we used to rotate those fin clips uh, uh, to, uh, you know, for different year classes of fish. Well, that only goes, gets you so far. We repeated a lot of clips over a lot of years. So yes, the old, on the older fish, the fin clips um, do mean something. They're quasi year class identifiers, but once those fish get to a certain size and age, you really can't use them for much. And they were not used mostly, mostly they were used for the entire plant in the lake. They were, there were some specific clips that were used historically for certain release sites, but very few. So on these big old lake trout, if you got an RP clip or something like that, you know, chances are it could be any, anywhere of four different year classes separated by five or six years. So not, not all that useful. Um, certainly not as unambiguous as our coated wire tag fish, where if we can read the tag, we can go back and tell you everything about it. So, so uh, just for, yeah, I put a uh, link in the chat box to our salmon and trout fin clip list and it has lake trout back to 2008. Yeah. If you also go to our management reports page, you can see other fin clip uh, reports back a couple of years that'll probably get you lake trout back to 2002 maybe yeah. even near 2000 if you're interested and and if you go to the great lakes fishery commission website there's the great lakes fish stocking database which we manage out of our office it's served it's served up on the commission website we can circulate that uh, link too and that has every lake trout that's ever been stocked in Lake Michigan and all the other Great Lakes combined and other fish too. So, so just to get, give everyone a little bit of a sense of what we're dealing with, those rotational fin clips, I, I wanna say they were employed every five or six year classes, but the, the fish that we see, um, you know, we had been using coated wire tags at some sites since the 1980s. And, you know, we had a coated wire tag that came back last year. We had an angler with a 34 year old lake trout we had two that were 33 in the database. I mean, those are exceptions, not the rule, but um, you know, any given fin clip could potentially represent two, three or four different uh, year classes, um, depending on the size of the fish and how old that fish is, which we wouldn't know just from the fin clip. Any other questions for Matt or uh, any other presentations or general comments, questions as we look to wrap this up shortly? All right. Go ahead, Jerry. Um, one thing I'm going to agree with that uh, Bob had said earlier today or earlier in this thing, um, some positive news about the uh, hatchery would be wonderful, Brad. I think it's time that that gets out in the public um, via Paul Smith, whoever, to put out a positive press release and something that, you know, some of the people here in the forum have been grumbling and griping about for years to try and get moving. And, and uh, I, I really think it's time that we show that this is a win-win for everybody. So. Yeah. And, and just to be clear, Jerry, you're talking about uh, 
some kind of story, et cetera, on the Kettle Moraine Springs Fish Hatchery renovation? Uh, yeah, you broke up, Brad. I didn't oh. quite hear you, but. Uh, you're, you're specifically talking about something, uh, a news story about the Kettle Moraine Springs Fish Hatchery. Well, that it's done, it's complete, right? Yep. I believe is, and, and that, you know, it's working. Uh, pictures of, of it in, pro, in business right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, let's face the facts. I've been all over you for about, what, four years now to try and get this thing moving and, and you know, finally it's happened. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely pass that on and, and see if what the plans are for sure. And and go ahead. Sorry, I just want to. I mean, there are uh, rainbow. <laughs> our future uh, stocking of rainbow is in Kettle Moraine Springs, to my uh, as far as I know. And uh, I mean, that's the kind of stuff I I, I really think it should be out there. Yep. Duly noted. Any other questions or comments? Um, I see one from Kevin talking about looking for uh, more salmon browns and rainbows versus Lakers. And that's certainly, if you go back to Cheryl's presentation as well as our stocking plan moving forward, uh, Wisconsin's going down to 45,000 lake trout starting next year in response to uh, comments and information from anglers in Wisconsin on lake trout and other salmon stocking levels. Going back to Jared. Yeah, one other thing too that I want to reiterate on is that brook trout thing. I think that needs to be looked into a little more. Uh, I think there's plenty of good tributaries up and down this lake shore, as well as uh, in the Bay of Green Bay um, uh, that Keith was talking about that uh, definitely would help with, uh, you know, tourism and everything with people being able to fish these fish, not just in two ports. Um, I don't think that was ever looked at very close to, I mean, I don't know. I don't agree with a lot with that at all. Um, it's still soupy. So sure. you know. yeah, I got that one down too. Yeah. It, uh, question. Yeah. Any questions, Keith? So anything about uh, we can open up for other questions, maybe the presentations or any other general questions for a bit. I don't know how long Titus wants to monitor here. Go ahead, Keith. Unmute you here, Keith. Okay, try it now. Okay, try it now. Okay, I see that. Um, and I, I think this goes back to what Charlie has talked about in recent years, and I have as well, as we've both been on this forum a long time, is would like to revisit in future about the walleye in Green Bay and they seem to be expanding into Lake Michigan according to Charlie's um, surveys and then that's my, I think that's correct um, about I mean, we have the stocking numbers you know the models that say you can only stock so many of these salmonids uh, because of predation <clears throat> But the walleyes are included in this, and you know you could plant Michigan or Wisconsin or whoever could stock two million walleyes without any regard for what the natural reproduction is and such. Um, so we know they're big time predators. They're a top predator. They're they're found everywhere in Green Bay, and I'm sure as soon as they start showing up in Boma, Manitowoc tours in the spring. When they're stocking fish, it, it might happen, might not happen. I don't know, but I, I, I just would like to see some lakewide talk about the numbers of walleyes that go into the lake because it, it's, it's, it's you know, for if we're regulating everything, we, we talk about all this with some, some on it so much. 
but we never talk about the walleyes and our top predator. And I really would like to see more talk about this. And I know it's a multi-state thing. You know, we're right on the border, of course. So we have to deal with Michigan, we have to deal with Wisconsin. Um, I know Tammy was on here earlier. I'm sure, you know, she knows all about this and how it's going to be a challenge, but we really need to start talking about this because we, we were hearing these big numbers of walleyes being uh, reproduced naturally, but still they're being stocked pretty heavily. And we don't know the movement of these fish. I know there's studies out there that are coming out about this, but I would really like to see more talk about this in the future. It, more of a comment than anything, but I'd like to see it put on the, the discussion table. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. Anything else out there for the good of the group? You still with us, Mr. Chairman? Titus? Yep, I'm here. Um, yeah, just uh, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, you know taking some time to to be with us, and uh, you know certainly topics send them my way. Um, you know, I think we may be virtual for a while. And if there is interest through the winter, you know, we can have maybe a shorter, you know, single topic, uh, you know, our, our meeting here and there, if people are interested. So yeah, thanks for uh, joining us tonight. Thanks, uh, Titus, for hanging in there and get, get well. Yep. Thank you.